engine tank is mechanically loaded into box cars. And these cars carry the concentrate containing about 57% zinc to the smelter at Josephstown, Pennsylvania on the Ohio River near Pittsburgh. Here is smelted all of the Balmat zinc production. And in addition, zinc concentrate from other mines in this country and abroad. The zinc concentrate enters the smelter for the final processes that will convert it to zinc metal or into a white powder, zinc oxide. Small power shovels are used to unload the cars. Elevators carry the concentrate into the smelter, which consists of six units. The roasters, acid plants, the sintering machines, the Cottrell precipitators and leach plants, metal furnaces, and the oxide furnaces. From the zinc concentrate storage bins, the concentrate is taken by belt to large mechanical roasters, where the 32% sulfur in the concentrate is burned and driven off as a gas, sulfur dioxide. This sulfur gas is drawn by fan to the contact acid plant, where it is converted to sulfur trioxide. It is then mixed with water to produce sulfuric acid. After most of the sulfur has been removed, the zinc concentrate is now called calcite. It contains about 68% zinc and 1% sulfur. This is transported on screw conveyors to sintering machines, where the remaining sulfur and the cadmium, lead, and silver are tuned off. In the leach plant, a large percentage of the cadmium, lead, and silver is recovered. The sinter containing about 59% zinc after being mixed with coal, is taken to the electric furnaces where the zinc is tuned off. From some of the furnaces, the vapor passes through condensers, and the product is zinc metal. But from other furnaces, the vapor is oxidized and passes to the bag house, where it is collected as zinc oxide. Yes, the smelter, six complete plants in one. Now, starting with the roasters, let's see the actual operation. This is the top drying hearth of a roaster. The hearth roasters are as tall as a four-story building, and the flash roasters are even taller. A series of blades, something like a gang plow, spreads the concentrate evenly and pushes it slowly to the outer edge when it drops into the first roasting hearth. In the roasting hearth, blades push the concentrate toward an opening at the center. It then drops to a second roasting hearth ultimately going through a series of 12 in all. In roasting, the sulfur is burned and driven off and unites with oxygen in the air to form sulfur dioxide. This is drawn by sands through large ducts to a contact acid plant, where it is purified and converted into sulfur trioxide. Finally, this is mixed with water to make sulfuric acid, a valuable byproduct. The roasted concentrates are called calcines. They still contain a small amount of sulfur and certain byproducts, which are usually cadmium, lead, and silver. In order to recover the byproducts, and to make a product which is suitable for the sintering machine, the calcines are mixed with silica sand and coke. A little water is also added in the rotating mixer. And the material is discharged onto the sintering machine where it is leveled out into an even bed. The coke is ignited in the mixture as the pallets move it slowly along over a wind box with a strong downdraft, just like a man smoking a pipe. The fumes from the wind box are drawn by sand through large Cottrell electric precipitators. After the byproducts have been removed, the sitter drops off the end of the machine in large chunks and is crushed to about the size of marble. The dust obtained from the precipitators is then treated in the leach plant with sulfuric acid to recover the byproduct metal, cadmium. Lead and silver, other byproducts, are also ultimately recovered. Cadmium metal is used in plating machine parts for protection against rust and also as a coloring pigment. This center is the product that is ready to be mixed with coke for feeding to electrothermic furnaces.
and so that you can better understand how a zinc metal furnace works. Here is a diagram of the entire metal furnace. The heat for smelting is derived from the resistance of the coke and fitter charge to the passage of the electric current in the electrothermic furnaces. Principal parts of the furnace are, first, the preheater, the rotary distributor which pours the mix into the furnace. This is a steel and fire brick structure about the height of a four-story building. About halfway up the furnace is a vapor ring which carries the zinc vapor to the condenser some 14 feet long. It's here that zinc vapor is condensed into metal. The condenser is made of steel, lined with a special silicon carbide brick. At times, it is necessary to install new carbon electrodes six feet long and 24 feet apart vertically. Electric current is introduced by these electrodes near the top and bottom of the furnace. As the electricity passes through the mixture of coke and zinc-bearing particles, it generates intense heat. The zinc passes off in vapor form. Here on top of the furnace, which every 24 hours produce as much as 45 tons of metal each, overhead hoppers feed the center and size coke in equal volume into rotating free heaters. The mixture is subjected to a blast of flame and then distributed into the top of the furnace. The charge height of the zinc metal producing furnaces must be regularly checked. It takes about 20 hours for the mix to pass down through the furnace. Having seen the top of the furnace, let's look at the bottom, where it is necessary to remove the slag so that a continuous feed may be maintained on top of the furnace. The furnace residue gradually reaches the rotating discharge table at the bottom of the furnace, four stories below the top level, at which feed enters the furnace. Poker truck assists the removal of slag from the discharge table. This material is later treated to reclaim the small amount of zinc and free coke. The portion reclaimed is either mixed with the powdered calcine in producing the center mix, or is put into the top of the furnace. When tapping the furnace, the men wear transparent plastic helmets and special shoes as protection against possible slag. The metal is drawn off periodically into ladles, which holds 14 to 1,500 pounds through a standpipe called a tapping well. The silvery liquid looks cool as it pours out, but it's five times as hot as boiling water. Casting zinc metal into molds requires close teamwork. As one man pours, another scrapes off the skinning. The metal is cooled by a water spray from beneath the mold. Even the pallet or bed on which the zinc slabs are shipped is made of zinc metal. Lot numbers are stamped on each slab. These correspond to the number of a sample taken of this batch of slabs. The slabs weigh about 55 pounds each. It takes skill to remove and stack them properly. Somewhat different from the zinc metal furnaces are the electric furnaces to make zinc oxide. Instead of condensers, they are equipped with ducts in which the zinc vapor burns and forms zinc oxide. The zinc oxide particles pass up ducts through funnel-shaped traps or cyclones, where the larger particles are removed and returned for reprocessing. The fine particles are blown along the duct into the bag house. Still suspended in the air and gas, like fine dust, they are pumped under pressure into these long cloth silver bags, which are closed at the top. The zinc oxide powder is caught in the silver bag as the gas and air in which it is carried passes through the cloth. At regular intervals, mechanical shakers loosen the light, fluffy zinc oxide from the inside of the bag, the powder falling into hoppers at the bottom of the filter bag. The zinc oxide is sifted through a wire screen as fine as a piece of cloth and is packaged in 50-pound paper bags. Now let's see the result of all this work, from mine to mill to smelter. From this 760-pound pile of ore from the mine, this 55 pounds of zinc metal, or this 68 pounds of zinc oxide are recovered. Zinc, the white metal, is now ready for countless uses in the home, farm, business, and industry.